Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life, the podcast. You're listening to Authors Corner, where we highlight and showcase our local authors. Today, I'm speaking to Mike Hassel, author of A Deep Trade-Off, Restoring Balance and Respect in a Polarized, Angry World. And Mike and I are going to be talking today on the topic, Understanding the Trade-Offs in Conflict. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Marna. You're very welcome. All right. So let me give you guys a brief introduction. Deep Trade-Offs helps readers find more balance, peace of mind, and even friendship in a polarized, angry world. In just 200 pages of conversational, even-handed thoughtfulness, this book probes the eternally conflicting values and truths tangled up in our shared concerns and divided commitments. More than 300 short quotes from Samuel Adams and Aesop to Oscar Wilde and Stevie Wonder illuminate the competing yet intertwined perspectives of sages, philosophers, artists, professors, pundits, and ordinary people with extraordinary insights. By entering the conversation, you'll fortify or challenge your own ideas about beliefs, truth, knowledge, ideology, peace, the subconscious, including intuition, and much more. Wise people see both sides of a problem and have a reason for choosing theirs. Rather than arguing, we can understand the trade-offs of, I mean, involve and choose our path with a fuller understanding of what we're getting and what we're giving up. So that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. So Mike, as we dive right in, you know, um, I love topics that I have experience in. And one of my, one of the most um, memorable parts of my high school education was being on the debate team. I absolutely loved it. Um, And on the debate team, uh, you know, you have a couple of minutes and you've got to argue in both sides. So that opened my, up my mind to hearing other people's opinion and seeing their side. So in your book, you write that wise people see both sides of a problem and then have a reason for choosing their side. Can you unpack that for our listeners? Sure. Um, I think a good place to start would be with how I came to be thinking about the trade-offs, and it's short. Um, I was born into a family of engineers, farm mechanics, auto mechanics. Uncle got a degree in electrical engineering and uh, ended up working at IBM making the barcode scanners. I really wanted to be Bill Steele. Went to Georgia Tech, have an electrical engineering degree. Uh, I was interested in humanities because I'm just broadly curious about everything and uh, ended up going into a management career rather than strictly engineering. So I was in a publishing business on the great ideas of history sort of pursuing, you know, these humanities things that I had never really fulfilled. And in at mid-age, around age 40, I had this aha moment that these problems, we, we were doing a series on the moral problems of our age, war and terrorism, drugs and alcohol, family and sexuality, abortion and euthanasia, et cetera. And particularly in the one on abortion and euthanasia, I saw that these are not problems like I think of problems as an engineer. I'm not going to have a formula or an algorithm or some structured decision process to arrive at an answer. And rather, these are separate moral truths, values, principles that are, they're they're valid, but they're in conflict and you can't realize all of them at one time. Something's got to give. And so, you know, this led over 20 years to thinking and researching and reviewing everything I read in that light and seeing examples of it. Uh, I've identified about 30 big trade-offs of this kind, uh, and I've written about three in the first book. Uh, but the idea is that uh, if you take them all together, is that there's not a right and a wrong answer in these problems. There are two right answers, uh, and their relative merits shift with the situation and the context and the background and the values and priorities that people have. So your experience is perfect for this because you get to put yourself in in other people's shoes and argue from their point of view. You know, I've heard that, uh, for instance, Jewish families do this in, in their culture. They, you know, you might think it's just argumentative, but I think it's a way of training people to see both sides of a problem and be wise about that. 
I love that. And I'm going to zoom in on the one that, um, uh, to me, it's a, it's, it's a perfect one to, to look at. Um, you can argue on both sides of the abortion table, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, you can argue that um, life begins as soon as there's conception and abortion is wrong. And you can argue that um, uh, if, a, if a mother r- recognizes that her child is going to live a, a life that's, you know, um, like if they have cerebral palsy or something, then it's her choice whether she wants to abort or if she got raped. And yeah, I mean, you can argue in both sides. Then you can argue, um, uh, you know, I, I, I remember a movie that had profound impact on me. And this was a, a girl, I think, I don't remember the name of the movie right now, but she was fighting in a ring and um, uh, she got sucker punched and fell and hit her head. And uh, she was, she, 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 she couldn't move. She'd lie there. She couldn't do anything for herself. And she wanted to die. And, um, <laughs> Um, and uh, nobody would, 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 would um, kill her. And, you know, she did it. She just, the only thing she can do is bite her tongue. And she bit her tongue, bit her tongue until someone agreed to help her die. So, I mean, uh, there's, I love that. So if we're saying that you can argue both sides, you can argue both sides, right? You know, and um, one, one way to look at this is that, you know, uh, there's a value to autonomy. In a free society, people ought to be respected to make decisions for themselves and not have to be told by someone else how they have to live, right? There's also right. respect for life. There is the right. duty not to harm, which involves both the mother and the baby. Right. Uh, you know, there's the rule, duty, respect for law, duty to respect the law. All four of those things are involved in both abortion and euthanasia. You cannot have all of those things. A lot of people feel so strongly about the duty not to harm, you apply it to the baby and not so much to the mother, and they're willing to tell other people what to do. Mm-hmm. Right? That would be the, the pro-life position. On the other hand, people who, who are way more uh, emphatic about independence and autonomy and that people who live their own lives and that uh, they emphasize the harm to the mother as opposed to harm to to whether it's a fetus or a child. But you, you, everybody knows these details, but I think it's helpful to reduce it down to those principles. We all believe in those four principles. Right. I think every decent person believes in that in some way or another. And so understanding that they are, they are all at play and they're not fully realizable humanizes us to understand that somebody who disagrees with us is not necessarily wrong. I love that. So... Um, uh, is your book, what is the solution in your book? Are you saying that, um, people should be allowed to make their own decisions, that it's no, it's not up to the government or what is your solution? Well, I'm not describing, uh, prescribing a solution for that. I'm pointing out the balance that has to be struck in these values. And so what I'm looking at is, for instance, peace and striving. We all say we're for peace. But we fight and we strive and we want to overcome injustices. And that's part of the purpose of living is to to address wrongs, right? Make things better. Uh, but that's not peaceful. We claim we're peaceful, but we don't behave that way. And so the point is to recognize that we're making these choices and neither one is as clearly right as we might like to think. Yes. Well, it's true. You know, um, acceptance. I learned that a long time ago is that you, that in any relationship, in order for it to prosper, you have to accept that other people have had a different path to you and they're different from you and what they think or what they believe, you, you shouldn't comment on it. You should allow them to, you know, have their own opinion. But I like what you say, that you say that conflict is a feature, not a bug. (laughs) <laughs> so why do, why 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 are we looking at conflict as a bug? Yes. So the reason people... I the reason I put it that way is some people seem to think that um, if there's conflict, there's something wrong. Somebody's not getting it right. There's a right, and we're we're disagreeing about how to get to right. And my point is, there's not a clear one right. There's multiple rights, and we're balancing them. And, and people with wisdom and humanity 
uh, take that into account and they don't condemn people that they don't agree with. So the point is, disagreement is inevitable in any, any group of people, particularly free people. I mean, our founders do this very well. They set up our institutions to check and balance so that you have to work with other people. Um, so uh, I think recognizing this symmetry, this seesaw kind of thing, this fact that none of us have, have it right, uh, is that our, even our most fervent beliefs may be true 80 or 90% of the time. You know, but if we think they're right 100% of the time, we're either perfect or we're dead. <laughs> Because we can't be improved, right? Right, right. Yeah, the interview that I just came off of um, before this one was very interesting. He talked about how we, um, each group has their own beliefs, right? And um, uh, you might have one belief in America, but if you go to Russia or the Ukraine, you have different beliefs. And, and who is to say that? you know, your belief is the correct one, right? So right. that's basically right. what we're what we're saying here, that, yeah, everybody well, isn't... I think about liberty and harm, duty not to harm. You know, some people think that uh, too much liberty is harmful because it lets people get away with things, right? So somebody in an autocratic society may be afraid of democracy. They haven't experienced it. They don't want that much freedom. They'd rather have restrictions that keep them safe. And indeed, a lot of our civic arguments were people looking for comfortable and safe and all those kind of words, and it reduces other people's liberty. It absolutely does when you when you uh, insist too much on, on safety and, and comfort. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, in your book, um, do you, you said you don't, you know, you're not offering a solution a minute ago, you're offering checks and balances, but are you offering a solution to how humans can learn to value other people's opinion? Yes. You know, I, the way I would put it is we value relationships rather than agreement and re more than solutions. You know, it's not that you and I have to figure out how we agree so we can be friends. And that seems to be an operating principle these days. I don't like that person. They don't agree with me and I can't, I can't talk to them anymore. Well, that's really lunacy because we disagree with people, you know, spouses, children, parents, it's part of human nature for people not to see eye to eye on everything. It's inevitable, and it's not a problem. You know, the problem is coercion, which is trying to make somebody else live by my choices of what's best. Mm -hmm. And so that's the message I'm trying to give in, in this discussion is that there's good reasons for seeing either side, and there's there's very little reason to think that you should be able to impose your, your choices on other people. Have yeah. to in the end, law has to, right? So it's not absolute that you could just do without making commitments. But how you make them now they bind other people is complex, and it should be uh, generous and humble. Yeah, I I definitely agree because in relationships, like I said earlier, that um, you have to learn to accept people and accept um, their beliefs. And you're right, a lot of people. Um, try to change people's beliefs you know i was i i just came back from a um a family vacation and um uh, one of uh, you know my my brother's um wife was trying to get people to to buy into something that she was saying and she kept saying it over and over again and i said to her why is it important that people think that you're right <laughs> because neither of us know it was something as stupid as we were in an airbnb that was beautiful and i'm saying that this person created this house for an airbnb and she kept saying no they created it so that they can use it and then decide to rent it so because I have been in the Airbnb space and I understand business. That was my belief. But she kept saying it over and over again. And I said, why is it important that you're right? Neither of us know. Yeah, <laughs> but right. that is that is how people go on in life. They keep saying things over and over and over, trying to coerce you, which is exactly what you just said, for you to buy in to what they're saying, right? But yes. a lot of times, nobody knows for sure, right? Yeah, and there's a couple of things to take away from that. One is that 
people are not shoved into change, they're loved into change. You know, first of all, we need to change ourselves. I think that's a big part of your message is expecting us to change other people and all that is dicey. You know, we change ourselves first. We have control over that. Uh, but to the extent that we're going to find level points of agreement and compromise, you know, we should love people and show them why we think our way is good. Maybe they will accept that, that they're not going to accept hostility and force and coercion. Even if they're wrong, they're going to fight back. And uh, this gets to the subconscious part that you've referred to in your open remarks. It's a lot going on in our heads that we're not thinking about, not even aware of. We're making choices on these on these uh, dichotomies, on these balances that we're not quite fully aware that there even is a choice. And just as an example, focus and sensitivity. You know, I'm very focused and, and mentally, and my son had an attention disorder, and I learned to understand his distraction is his inability to control his attention. He could not focus because he couldn't command his attention. So th there's good reason to be sensitive, mm -hmm. right? There's also good reason to focus but you can't do both at the same time, right? And so that's the kind of thing, we're completely unaware of that. Our subconscious is managing how we focus or not. And so a lot of us end up defending what we've already concluded or what we believe instead of listening and being impartial. We think that's what we are, we're rational and listening to the evidence, we're making reasoned conclusions, right? But a number of psychologists have really pointed out powerfully uh, that that's not the way we live. We see what we believe. We don't always just believe what we see. We're conditioned to look for what we wish to be true. And we say that's true because we want it to be true. Uh, you, you know, you can see a lot of that in recent weeks. You know, a president just stepped away from a campaign and a lot of people insisted he was something he wasn't. And I think that's not too controversial he's in, in the wake of the last few days. There's, he, he's got some deficits. But people were pretending that he didn't because they were afraid of the consequences, and uh, they saw what they wished to see. Yeah, yeah. Is that making sense? Yeah, there's there's a there's a parable that I that I use quite a lot, and it's it's important to bring it up here, where um, this guy came up to this monk and he said, "What kind of people live here? I'm thinking of moving." And the monk says. What kind of people live where you live? And he says, they're all liars and cheaters. And he says, <laughs> There's plenty of us here. Right? Yeah, this is what <laughs> That's fantastic. Live here. I love it. You're going to find what you're looking for. <laughs> this time we're going to look for it. You're going to live here. So basically, yes, you, um, uh, you know, people believe what they see and not necessarily, you know, see what they believe, right? So yes. that was one of the questions I have here. So, I'm glad that you you brought that up. But yeah, I mean, talking about Biden, I mean, we're not going to get into the political arena. We're going we'll to talk about the person. You know, um, uh, my pastor, um, uh, you know, had a message on Sunday and he was talking about one of the, the prophets in the Bible, Elijah, that was old and he was leading, right? Or Moses was old and he was leading to say that, right. that someone like Biden can't lead because he's old, even though he's an absolute faculty of his mind and is doing the hardest job on the planet. You know how hard it is to be president? Oh my goodness. They don't stop calling you. It's a 24 hour job. You don't even sleep. And he's been doing it. And then all of a sudden he's too old, you know, whatever. And he had to bow to the pressure and, and, and back down. But some people are thinking he's good enough to do the job. And some people yeah. are thinking he's too old. Right. So. Yeah. And that, that is not really resolvable, uh, you know, and the danger about talking about real life examples like abortion and Joe Biden is that people quickly divide into tribes mentally right. and they're defending <laughs> what they've concluded about it, where their interests lie. And you do it as well as I do it. And, you know, the way I deal with that in my book is talk about the uh, uh, story of the naked emperor you know, who's riding through the streets. And it's not an adult who sees the nakedness, it's a child. The child does not understand the implications of saying the emperor's naked, right? He's, everybody else is an adult. And if I admit that, then it's got this consequence, this might happen, and uh, people are way beyond the fact of whether he's nude or not. They're really <laughs> into consequences and implications. And children don't see that, and they can call it for what it is. And so the, some scientists describe that as their special skill. A Nobel scientist that I quote said, 
you know, I, I'm not smart. I'm just naive and simple and look at things in this, this uncomplicated way. And I get insights that other people don't have because they're looking right past an answer. Right, right, exactly. And that's exactly what's going on here, right? We're looking at consequences. We're looking at, you know, maybe he's too old to, to win or maybe he's, but, it's, but he says, I can do the job. <laughs> so that's not really yeah. what the question was, right? Right, um, right. Uh, so right. that is, uh, yeah. So I'm glad we're- So they call this confirmation bias and motivated reasoning as the terms right. of psychologists use. We're looking to confirm what we already think. And yes. um, our reasoning is motivated to get to that end. We're looking for exclude um, factors that argue against us and pick the ones and, and drive toward an answer. And so it's like a lawyer or a soldier, right? Rather than a scout. A scout right. is happy to be proven wrong because maybe your chances of uh, surviving are better. But if you're trying to an advocate, trying to get to an answer, then you're going to find ways to get to that answer, even if it's in all the time. Correct. We know that lawyers do it all the time. So uh, there's a skill to doing that. Yes, yeah. very true. Very true. So I'm glad that we're able to give real life real life examples, even though you say yes, real life examples. There are going to be camps because there are going to be people that believe very strongly in abortion and believe very strongly that you shouldn't. You know, somebody shouldn't have to be responsible for saying, I'm ready to die, all these different things. And then, of course, political, you can never, yeah, I, that's why I always stay away from that conversation. By the ways I deal with that is talk about picking principles, right? right? We pick our principles. If you're in the majority, you're all for democracy, right? Kind of the most votes because you have the most votes. As soon as you get in the minority, you're concerned about rights, minority rights and protection, you know, so- People pick their principle depending on which one advances the ends that they want. And sometimes without any awareness that they're unfairly just picking the rules that make them the winner. Right, of course. Right. It's 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 all subjective, right? So right. So that's true. All right. Well, our topic is trade offs and conflicts. So I want to get to that. Um, what are the trade offs and conflicts? What are you talking about? In the book that I've published, uh, I talked about three. Uh, I've identified thirty. Frankly, and, and uh, so um, you know, there may be six or seven or eight more books about this uh, if if there's a good audience for it. Uh, but I've identified. I, I went through an inventory of values, and uh, there's a two hundred more in this list that I have from several different sources, deduplicated. And then I went through and said, for every value, is there another competing value that I can identify? And I did. In every case, there's something else. Uh, you know, like a kindness, for instance. That's a hard one to figure out a good alternative to. But a lot of football coaches will tell you that doesn't work with some of their players. You know, they, they need to have what they call tough love. And it's not what we think of as kindness, right? Mm. And so in every case, you can think of something that really kind of conflicts with it. In, in the first volume, The Deep Trade-Offs, the book I've written, first chapter is about uh, peace and striving. Touched on that a moment ago, that uh, we often struggle and for good reason, because that's the way we accomplish things. It's painful, et cetera. Being comfortable and, and all of that is, is uh, not our end point. Secondly, uh, the second chapter is about imagination and reality. You know, each of us has ideals, and this is kind of a corollary to imagination. And ideology comes from trying to reach our ideals, uh, but they're they're not real. They're fantasy in many cases that we're going to all be equal, for instance. We're born unequal. We have different talents. We have different sources. We have different parents, different, live in different places. We're capable of doing different things uh, because of where we are. And so we can never be fully equal in condition, right? Uh, and if we were to try to be, it conflicts with liberty. That's a future chapter is liberty and equality. Um, but the second chapter is ideals in reality and how do we come to terms with our fallenness, our inability to live in a utopia. People have tried to make utopias, they never work. So come to terms with our, our shortcomings uh, and our lack of ability to realize our ideals. That's number two. Number three is honesty and deception, which is a little odd, but who's going to say they're on the side of deception, right? But we all uh, choose deception in certain cases. We lie to our kids about Santa Claus. Okay, A lie is an intentional deception, just to shorten the, the discussion of what it is. And uh, I don't feel bad about telling my kids about Santa Claus because it brings them joy. 
Now, if that is another value that we choose, you know, maybe we don't tell somebody that they're dying because it will hurt them. It will make them suffer. And so duty not to arm conflicts with telling the truth, right? Survival. All of us are going to choose to lie if it means we have a chance to survive. If we get the terrorists to, you know, look that way while I duck out this door. Uh, everybody, I think, well, a reasonable person would say that's a legitimate choice to make. And so we say that maybe truth is our highest value, but it's not. Survival comes first. Avoiding suffering probably is not far behind. Bringing joy is, is another one. So you, you begin to see the point that there are alternative values at play that compromise even our what we think is the most obvious truth. Yeah, I like that one because, you know, when you go to the doctor and he tells you without ever, um, I've seen it happen several times. It happened to me and it just happened recently to my husband where you, you, the doctor is looking at some results and he's saying things like, I'm sure you've got cancer. And I'm thinking that's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. maybe he's thinking that um, uh, it's just better to just spit it out. But I'm thinking that you should, cancer's a death sentence. You should not be saying that if you don't know for sure, because it wasn't true for me. It wasn't true for my husband. But they say things like that. So, you know, if you you know, somebody might think, okay, maybe the doctor might know you have cancer, but did he doesn't want to say because he doesn't want you to, you know what I mean? There's, yeah. You're right. You can't argue with both sides of the, the coin in that one. Yeah, if, if, I knew, if I knew right now you're going to die tomorrow, I would not tell you, right? That would not be a hurtful thing to do. You know, and, and in these genetic tests we do, there are some that are death sentences. And why learn that you've got this, this disease that you cannot prevent? I think it's Huntington's disease that my wife has told me about. And, you know, we ask about Alzheimer's and things like that. But there are genetic predictors, say you're at higher risk for things, some things I don't want to know that I'm at higher risk for because it's going to ruin what time I do have. That's right. right? So. But the question is, should it be my choice or somebody else's choice for me to know? So the, the, the story spins on out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love it. I love what we opened with that, um, uh, that we can always argue on both sides and we choose one that's, that is, is, is based on our um, Yes journey and how we're thinking you know what i mean like you just yeah. said that you wouldn't want to know if you if you if you um if you have a a, a life-threatening illness and some people would say i want to know right it's just again right. you can right. <laughs> so there's one other interesting point to make here uh um, andy duke wrote a book called thinking in bets and her point is that there are probabilities involved in almost everything we do we make choices that we think are going to make our future better but there's never 100% reliability that it's going to do that. And we think, though, that we're right or wrong, and that if we admit that we're wrong, we were 100% right, we've got to change all the way to the other pole, right? That's a bad way of that black and white thinking, because uh, it's a massive shift. People will not do it very easily. But if you come to the general understanding that you're probably right about 60 or 70% of the time with a particular choice, and 30 or 40% of the time there's reason to do something else, well, circumstances may come along that flip that very quickly and say, well, in this situation, that 30 or 40 is a better bet. And it makes you more flexible. It makes you more more um, tentative. It makes you more human, uh, at, at, at least in your ability to to respect someone else's dignity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a great conversation. I love it. You know, and... Um... We're talking about transforming the mind. We're talking about expanding the mind. We're talking about renewing the mind. All is in the same bucket. And um, uh, this is a great conversation to have on, uh, yes, I mean, on understanding that there are both sides and, and each person that picks a side has a reason, right? And you should respect yeah. that. So that's amazing. That's right. So um, let's talk about your book now. Your book is called Deep Trade-Offs, Restoring Balance and Respect in a Polarized, Angry World. So why did you write it? And what do you want readers to walk away with after reading? 
I wrote it because I had discovered this aha thing that was really important to me as an engineer where I'm trying to find answers and find principles to live by and, and you know, trying to apply this in the arts and the, you know, the arts of life as opposed to my profession. Um, and, and I had this, this aha moment that got me thinking differently. So over 20 years, I was seeing examples of this. Now I see them every day. Every time I open up the paper, I see, you know, uh, balance uh, kind of dichotomies like this. And so I kept examples of it. I had this feeling that I was going to try to do something with it. And after 20 years, I collected a lot of them. And then it occurred to me, you know, this is, this is a great way of approaching polarization. Everybody was complaining about polarization. I think I started four years ago. Uh, so this would, would have been, you know, 2020. Trump was ending his first term. Polarization had been with us at least five years since he was a candidate, right? And people, I had one guy came to me and said, it started with Trump, didn't it? And I said, no, it started with humanity, you know, and in the United States, it started before the founding. You know, I've got quotes from Adams and Jefferson calling each other hermaphrodites, mm -hmm. you know, you know, son of a mulatto, it's gender and racial stuff. You know, we think it's new to us. It's hundreds of years old, people finding those kind of ways to insult each other. Yeah. Democracy is rowdy, and we should expect it. Not not expect we're all going to get along. So, to, as a matter of fact, our institutions are good ways of channeling disagreement, not creating agreement. They're channeling mm -hmm. disagreement. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, the, I wrote the book because I saw there was an application to the problems of our day. It's the reason I titled the subtitle the way I did. But the more general concept of the trade offs is it's a broad idea that I've had for forty years. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Yes. We should all learn to get along, right? <laughs> well, there's advantages to it. I was in a Sunday school once where this lady said, uh, you know, if we think we ought to love everybody, we haven't met enough people. <laughs> I thought, this is the place to be. If you can say, hard to do. <laughs> you can say that out loud. I'm, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> So, it's I mean, you know, very darn hard to do. Like Jesus talk about loving your neighbor as yourself and taking the other cheek when someone slaps you. Very hard to do. Very well, hard. Think about how lovely it is to laugh with somebody, even if you vehemently yeah. disagree with them about something. But if you share some sense of awe about a sunset, about an agreement, about a child, about doing something for the deity together, you know, you can get beyond these disagreements and, and, Build community, and and in the end, I think that's what satisfies. Well, you're right. Find the common ground because we all got it, and it comes out when there's a tragedy. We find the common ground. So right. yes, so it's a yeah, good the politics is way down the list of what matters. Politics <laughs> way down the list of what matters. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good way to end the conversation. Yes, regardless of the different differences, we all have common ground. You know, we probably all love our children or parents or God or something. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So find the common ground. So that's amazing. Well, Mike, this has been a great conversation. I am glad that you expanded my awareness on uh, conflict and, you know, take me back to my debating years. Um, of uh, being able to argue on both sides and seeing other people's point of view. And um, yes. Can I leave um, you with one idea? Can I leave you with one idea? Sure. Go ahead. If you ask yourself the question, what is the meaning of life? And we could be here for days trying to resolve that, right? You have your ideas, I have ideas. If I were to say instead, where do you find meaning in life? You may have a whole set of answers that are true for you. I may have a whole set of answers that are true for me. They may be completely different. Well, we know right away that they are both right. right? Yes. And so this idea that there's not one answer to things, there's multiple answers that be, that deserve to be considered. Uh, and maybe not always embraced. We may still disagree about things, but we can respect people who choose other options. I love it. I love it. And we touched on it only slightly, but... You know, we're using the word polarization, we're using the word disagreements. It can happen in marriages, which is why a lot of marriages end in divorce. Because, yeah, it's not only political, it's like right in your own. <laughs> Even parents and children have different ideas because the child is saying, oh, you're too old. It's now a new day and this is what's going on right now. 
Um, and the parents saying, nope, you know, so yes, conflict, disagreements, you know, learning to understand the other side. Yes. I love what I you I was said. leaving a Pilates yeah. class one day. Yep. Mm-hmm. I was leaving a Pilates class one day and they were standing there asking for people who would volunteer to give advice to the kids that were around this community center. And so I, I put on the, the whiteboard there and learn to manage conflict because you're going to have plenty of it, even in your yeah. marriage. And, you know, just because, uh, well, just because somebody disagrees with you, it doesn't mean you can't love them, right? And so you never say you always, you never, because that turns a disagreement about a topic into a personal attack, right? right? Then it's about you and old wounds and all that. So learning to manage conflict skillfully is just an essential life skill. I wish they taught this in the sixth grade. <laughs> yes, very, very true. Very, very true. And on my journey of uh, you know personal development, I've learned a thing or two about that, you know, being in it from interpersonal relationships. And I've learned that. And 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 I think that that's really is what I came here to to do is to learn these same lessons um, about, yeah, transforming your mind, renewing your mind. Um, and it works with conflict. It works with, you know, understanding someone's point of view. It works with accepting someone else. It works with, you know, never blaming it. could We can go on and on and on, but you're very right. You know, conflict resolution and um, learning how to get along is one of the most important things. Right. Or not one of the most important things. It's like, yeah, it's one of the things it's, you should learn. It's way right. up there. Right. It's we, have to keep, we, we have to keep relearning these things. You know, they're, yes. they're not easy. We need to be reminded. And uh, so th- that's gets back to how the brain works. And, you know, one of the metaphors that Jonathan Haidt uses, psychologist, is the brain is like an elephant with a rider on top. And the rider is your rational mind trying to make this massive thing go where you want it to go. But it's going to go where it wants to go anyway. Instincts, intuitions, you know, trained reflexes, uh, natural reflexes that are untrained, et cetera. He says that's like 80% of what's going on up here. And wrestling that uh, is a daily task. And developing the habits that do it well is an even longer task. So... It's very got to do the work, right? You got to yeah. do the work, right? It mm-hmm. doesn't come naturally. You got to do the work. So, thank you, Mike, for your book. Um, uh, um, uh, tell our listeners where they can pick up a copy of your book. Um, tell us your website and if you're on social media, where your social media handles are. The book is available everywhere. If you go to a bookstore, they can order it. As you know, the book trade now doesn't keep the thousands, well, millions of books that are published every year. So they can order it. Uh, you can also order it at Amazon, of course. See the reviews there uh, that, that I think are pretty revealing about what, what the book has meant to them. Uh, my website is deeptreatoffs.com. Um, there's a place there where people can write to me if they would like. Uh, it's kind of a placeholder at this point. It's just got some blurbs and a, you know, a connection, a link to Amazon for people who want to get the book. You know, as the audience builds for this, I'll be building out that website with more functions, perhaps discussion groups and things like that. Uh, but for now, it's just a place where you can get in touch with me if you want. And um, uh, I'm on Facebook, Mike Hassel, when you're in Nashville. And uh, uh, that's that's the best way to get a hold of me is probably through deep trade-offs or uh, I don't really use Facebook Messenger because I decided a long time ago I'd had enough notifications and distractions in my life. So <laughs> the website is the best way to get in touch with me. I want to do that yes. directly. No problem. Okay. So yeah, so um, I will have a transcript of my conversation with Mike on the show page, which is myhelps.us. I will link out to his um, book uh, and I also link out to his website. And, um, uh, you know, tag him on social media when I, um, you know, promote the, the episode on, on Instagram and Facebook. So, yeah, if, you, um, uh, if this conversation resonated with you and um, you want to explore it further, um, like we said, you know, learning to understand that, you know, everybody has um, a reason for picking their opinion. And it's usually, you know, you shouldn't try to coerce someone to come over to your side. Instead, you should learn to understand where they're coming from. 
And um, uh, Mike's talking about the trade-offs and, you know, and uh, the polarization of, you know, right from wrong or honesty from deception and, you know, kindness to tough love and, and all the other things that it's great for us to learn. Um, and, you know, we walk around a lot of times unconscious about things. And one of the things I do in the show is to bring your awareness to things because, they said that a mind that's expanded with knowledge can never return. So now that we have brought the conversation of trying to understand the trade-offs of choosing a side and, and understanding other people's opinions and journeys or whatever. So I hope you pick up a copy of, of, of Mike's book and um, learn more on this topic. And uh, he says, if you want to connect with him and you can, you know, reach out to him on his website. But I mean, I think that it's a, you know, it's it's a great conversation and great um, learning to have. All right. A lot more to write about this, and I'd love to hear from your listeners about what resonates with them or what they find troublesome or uh, unacceptable. You know, yes, both sides. Exactly. I, I'm all ears. Yes, exactly. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you guys for tuning in to this week's episode of Author's Corner. Um, Mike's book, again, is called Deep Trade-Offs. Restoring Balance and Respect in a Polarized and Angry World. So pick up a copy. Um, it's available on Amazon, wherever books are sold. Um, or you can pick up, you can reach out to him on his website. Mike, thanks for being on the show. Thank you guys for tuning in. Until next time, namaste. Thank you, Marna.